I'm Ed Harrison for Real Vision, talking to Lee Cooperman, who is the CEO and president of Omega Family Office. Lee, nice to talk to you. Nice to be with you. Thank you. You know, I was just telling you right before how I was thinking about uh, talking about this, because you spoke to my uh, colleague, Grant Williams, right when you were leaving uh, the uh, hedge fund business, I guess you could call it, uh, Omega Advisors and turning it into a family office. And I think this is a good opportunity to make it sort of a follow on conversation to that. But for those people who don't know who you are, maybe you can give them a, a little peek into your pretty storied history and resume. Well, uh, with all modesty, I just say I've lived the American dream. You know, I was first generation in my family born in America, uh, first generation to go to college. All my schooling was a public school based up until business school. I went to PS 75 in the South Bronx, Morris High School in the South Bronx, Hunter College in the West Bronx. I followed the advice of Harlan Greeley, who said, go West, young man. So I went from the East Bronx to the West Bronx. And then I had a short stint at Columbia Business School, which opened the door to Wall Street. And I started my career in, in Wall Street in uh, February 1st of 67 with a six-month-old kid, no money in the bank. Uh, and a student loan to repay, and I've made a lot of money, and happy to say I've taken a giving pledge with Warren Buffett, and I plan to give it all away. So it's been the American dream. I've been very lucky. And a- along the way, you were at Goldman, made partner, were there for 25 years before I you- spent, when I, uh, I got my degree on January 31st of 1967. Mm-hmm. The six-month-old kid had no money in the bank, had a student loan to repay, so I couldn't afford to take a vacation. So I went to work at Goldman the next day, as an analyst, uh, February 1st of 1967. And I rose to the ranks and became partner in charge of research, uh, chairman of the investment uh, policy committee. And then I started Goldman Sachs Asset Management two years before I retired. And I retired from Goldman at the end of 91 to start Omega. And I had Omega for about 25 years at the end of, nine, of 2018. I decided to convert to a family office. And what I say is if you, I've seen it a hundred times, but Godfather two, there's a scene at the airport where Hyman Roth is being interviewed and right before they shot him, he said, I'm a retired executive living on a pension. I'm a retired money manager living on investment income. The bad news is I have no active income. All my income is dividends, interest, capital gains and losses. And uh, the good news is I have no pressure. At age 77, I think that was a worthwhile swap. Uh, I was shocked I did it because I love the business. All my friends were very surprised and my friends asked me how my life is gonna change. And I told them in, at the end of 2018, that's about two years ago, that I plan to sleep an hour later in the morning. I, I've been a workaholic and I get up at five in the morning, schlep into New York City to go to work in my office in Manhattan. Uh, I sleep an hour later in the morning, number one. Number two, I'm going to get to the gym three times a week. I'm a bit of a chunky guy and I figure I spend some time getting my uh, health in uh, better shape. Uh, though I've been very blessed, I'm in good health. Uh, and third thing, uh, w- and I've done the first two, uh, the virus has interfered with the getting to the gym as often as I like to get to the gym. But the third thing I said I was going to do, which I haven't done, is I have very good card sense, but I've never learned the bidding and bridge. And my wife is a very good bridge player, so I said I was going to take lessons and learn the bidding and bridge. But I've been so damn busy with the stock market, I've not had the chance to do that. And the other thing they said I was going to do is be more long-term oriented, tax efficient, and since I'm, the bulk of my financial assets are in equities, I would look to diversify a little bit uh, into non-equities. Interesting. Yeah, we, we should talk about that in, uh, closer to the end, in ter- especially given that- Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, It costs you $1 to get a month's access to this incredible treasure trove. I don't think you can afford to be without it. In equities, I would look to diversify a little bit uh, into non-equities. 
Interesting. Yeah, we, we should talk about that uh, closer to the end, in ter- especially given that bonds are giving you zero, you know, where you're diversifying, what you think of private markets and stuff like that. Sure. Well, any questions you have, I'll try to give you my best shot. Okay, great. You know, I, I was telling you before, I went to Columbia Business School and you're, you're a Columbia Business School guy. The reason actually I went to Columbia Business School was because of Ben Graham and Warren Buffett, you know, sure. value investing. Uh First of all, why did you end up at, at Columbia and did you get the value investing bug? Yeah, well, uh, I wound up in Columbia probably because of location. Uh-huh. I grew up in the Bronx. I was living in Riverdale. Uh, I wanted to get an advanced degree and Columbia was very convenient. And really Columbia changed uh, the trajectory of my life because I don't think it's right, uh, but I never probably could have gotten into Goldman Sachs with a degree from Hunter College. So when I got the MBA from Columbia, and I was a, a good student, I was straight A's in Columbia, I was Beta Gamma Sigma, Wall Street Journal Student Achievement Award, and I had a very focused interest. And uh, back in 1966, when I was interviewing, uh, offers were plentiful, very different than the environment today. And uh, so I've been uh, very lucky. Uh, I, uh, I didn't know much about value investing. I didn't know much about investing. Uh, I, I studied under Roger Murray, uh, the professor at Columbia and Sidney Robbins, who gave a course in portfolio management. Roger Murray was the commensurate professional, and uh, I, I learned a lot from him and taking my course in security analysis. And I remember back in '66, I had two resumes when I was interviewing, uh, and the, the biggest challenge was trying to remember who I was talking to. <laughs> I was uh, one resume said desire a position on financial staff of major multinational corporation. Uh, thinking of Exxon or at that time was Standard Oil, New Jersey, uh, General Foods, somebody like that. And the other resume said desire position on, uh, in the Wall Street Research Department doing research on companies. And so I had to remember if I was talking to Goldman or Morgan Stanley or whoever, or was it talking to General Foods or Exxon. Um, and uh, I wound up going to Goldman Sachs. And I, you know, when people say what makes for success, I say three things. One is hard work. Uh, to this day, I still work very hard. Uh, a lot of luck uh, and intuition. So the, the luck is understandable and, 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 and hard work is understandable. So what do you mean by intuition? Well, I give people two examples, which were very pivotal. Uh, back in the 60s, if you finish your major and minor in college in three years, they allow you to count your first year of medical or dental school towards your fourth year of college and you get a separate degree. So in the summer of 1963, I worked very hard, took physical chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania. Chemistry was my major, knocked off my major, and I enrolled in the University of Pennsylvania Dental School. And after eight days, I was wondering whether I was making the right decision, or I was pushing myself in a direction that was not fully committed. It was very traumatic because you got to think about it. I, you know, I, I, I paid tuition for a year. I paid my room and board for a year. I, uh, when I bought my instruments to, for the laboratory, uh, they tell you drill your initials into your instruments because the things have a way of disappearing in the lab. So they were worthless. So it was $1,200 worth of equipment that I paid for. And I had a, uh, all my friends and my dad may rest in peace. My dad was walking around saying my son, the dentist. And I had to go back to the Dean of Hunter College and get permission to matriculate back in. Um, and uh, I did that. And because I had all electives available, my major and minor were complete in three years. I had all electives. I took 10 courses in economics in my final senior year. I got 10 A's, graduated with honors in economics, even though my major was chemistry. So that was intuition, making a big decision to go on a different path. And then secondly, when I was interviewing in 1966, uh, the market was at a high. Uh, and I, w- I was an attractive package, not physically, but you know, I, I, I was Beta Gamma Sigma, Wall Street Journal Student Achievement Award. I had a six-month-old kid. I had a very focused interest. Uh, and so I was attracted, I had 16 job offers. Goldman wasn't the best offer uh, financially. It was Goldman did not allow their analysts to handle brokerage business, whereas some of the other firms did. I remember the fellow that extended the offer, terrific guy from Yankton, South Dakota. His name was Bob Danforth, a uh, real down-home kind of guy. Uh, one of the few times in my life I missed a deadline, and he calls me up and says, Lee, we're disappointed we haven't heard from you. What can we say? I said, Bob, let me explain. I'm broke. I have a number of job offers, four of which are higher than Goldman's, but I liked everybody I met there. And I was very familiar at that time with the Union Carbide had a book on compound interest tables. And uh, the offer was for 12.5. 5 
And I said to him, do you think I can make $25,000 in five years? A double in five years is 15% compound. And he said to me, if you work hard and keep your nose clean, I think you could do it. So I said, okay, I'm going to come. So there I went to a place that was paying me less than somebody else, even though I was broke, because I liked the people I met. And when you look back at that decision, how many firms have not changed their name in the last you know, 50 years? Goldman is about the only one. You know, you could have gone to uh, Kuhn Low, White Weld, Good Body, Low Bros, all of which disappeared. So I went to a firm that uh, was around, and the year I became a partner in 1976, the firm earned $40 million. And the year I retired in 1991, they earned $1.8 billion. So I was there for that whole ride. So I, I've been very lucky. I've worked hard, but, you know, you can work very hard and not be, uh, you know, not come out as well. But I've been very lucky, been very blessed. You know, how was that transition from being a sell side analyst uh, and a researcher to putting your money where your mouth is, basically, as a, a, a hedge fund guy? It wasn't that difficult for me because I was always an investment oriented guy. Uh, you know, even to this day, you know, at that time, I walked around, I had uh, index cards with my portfolio on it. The only thing that's happened is the number of index cards have increased. Uh, but I, I always invested. And, uh, you know, uh, being a portfolio strategist was kind of putting bread on the table. That's what the firm paid me for. But my most enjoyable thing in my career was finding something somebody else didn't see, making a bet and having Mr. Market prove me right. So, for example, I was the world's living expert at the time, uh, a, a company called Teledyne, run by uh, one of the most brilliant men I've ever dealt with, uh, Dr. Henry Singleton, who regrettably passed away from brain cancer. But he was a brilliant guy, and I learned a lot by observing him. So um, it wasn't a difficult transition, and uh, um, it was a happy transition. I like doing well. I like making money in the market, in my case, so I can give more away. You know, I've taken the giving pledge with Buffett, and I told Warren nine years ago that it's a very meritorious request, but only asking for half isn't asking for enough. You know, so I, I plan to give away uh, all my money uh, upon my demise. That's amazing. Uh, you know, um, I also, I want to, uh, let's fast forward all the way to uh, the here and now of sorts. Um, okay. The uh, I'll tell you what's on my mind is that I, when I go back two years, I remember specifically that everyone and his brother were, was coming out and saying that, OK, bond yields, uh, they're ridiculous. They're at ridiculous levels. This was the beginning of 2018. Now they're ridiculous squared. Right, exactly. And and Jeremy Grantham in particular, he was saying, that's it. You know what what I expect to happen now is I expect to I expect the parabolic rise in the market uh, from here. You know, we, we haven't gotten there yet. We don't see the signs of euphoria, but that's what's coming. Who was looking for a parabolic rise? Uh, Jeremy Grantham of GMO. I, I thought he's bearish. Are you saying two years ago he was bullish? This was two years ago in 2018. He was saying, you know, uh, we're going to get the blow off top. But almost immediately after that, we had this Volmageddon scenario. Yeah, where, right, right, yeah, yeah. His timing wasn't down. particularly good, yeah. And so, you know, to from my perspective, that just kept uh, the market churning along. But only now, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, have we gotten this blow off top. Uh, all of the signs of speculative euphoria, to me, are all over the place. Mm -hmm. I, I want to get a sense of, um, you know, when you think of that whole time period from 2018 mm -hmm. to, say, pre-pandemic, what was going on there? How, how are you thinking about the markets in that period? Well, you know, I've been often quoted uh, 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 Sir John Templeton, where I said, uh, bull markets are born in pessimism. They grow in skepticism. They mature in optimism. They die in euphoria. And we were just starting to knock on the door of euphoria before the virus hit. Uh, and in some respects, you know, you, we're knocking on the door of euphoria again now. You, you've referenced the IPO market, the SPAC market. Every schnook who, who wants to raise a SPAC can seemingly raise the money. They even called me and said, Lee, you have a good reputation. We'd like to raise you a SPAC. And I said, listen, I don't want responsibility of managing anybody's money except my own. You know, uh, there's if you, if you take the game seriously, it's a lot of pressure. And at age 77, I don't need the pressure. But... Um, I would say I see a lot. Let me, if with your permission, I'd like to read you something. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. About a month and a half ago, a friend of mine asked me what I thought about the market. And I'm going to read you what I said, wrote to him six weeks ago. 
my view is simple. The economy has been on some form of life support since 2008. This should reduce PEs, all things being equal, I mean the government's involvement. We never made it out of QE, and now it's free money for a long time. No one seems to care about negative, massive debt being created. I do. Lastly, multiples are a function of growth rates, confidence, and interest rates. Future growth is likely to be less than historical, given the need to allocate more of income to debt service. I think it's fair to say confidence in the future is less. That leaves us with rates, which are clearly driving the market. Two observations. One, if rates belong where they are, your returns in the stock market should be well under 5%. And second, central bank policy towards rates seems wrong to me. So, you know, I I have a very conservative view about the market presently because I'm worried about who pays for the party when the party is over. This nation just celebrated its 244th birthday. It took 244 years to go from no national debt to 21 trillion. That's going up at the rate of four or five trillion dollars a year. That's a growth rate, far in excess of the growth rate, growth rate of the economy. Okay, now we, we, we're pulling it off because the interest rates are zero, but interest rates aren't gonna be zero forever. If they are, they're gonna destroy the whole capital market line. They, they're gonna destroy capitalism. It just, it just doesn't make sense to me. And, I, and the point I make, you know, if you look, uh, you have negative interest rates or zero interest rates in Japan and Europe for a long time, their price earnings ratios are five or six multiple points lower than the United States. So I, I don't think negative interest rates are all that particularly positive. I find myself very conservative view at the present time. And I've made my money being a bull, to be honest with you. Right. And the market's very, co- market's very complicated because the Fed has created a situation where they're pushing everybody on the risk curve. Right. You know, uh, when I retired from Goldman in 1998, one of my closest friends is still a great friend, uh, the chief economist, I won't mention names, uh, he was strictly a T-bill guy. He didn't want to buy anything other than T-bills because he was very risk averse. Okay. So the guy or, or person who bought T-bills, I said, I can't survive on near zero. I'm going to take duration risk and I'm going to buy T-bonds. The T-bond buyer says, well, I can't survive on 60 or five basis points. I'm going to buy industrial credit. The industrial credit person says, well, 3% doesn't work for me. I'm going to buy high yield. The high <laughs> yield buyer says, well, I'm going to go into structured credit, CLOs and stuff like that, because of high yield. And the CLO guy says, well, I'm going to get permission to put 25% of my fund in stocks. And so everybody's moving on the risk curve. And one of these days, they're going to come back in off the risk curve. I don't know the date, but everybody says, Tina, there's no alternative. So to me, I don't own many bonds. I own very few. What I own in bonds is high yield. Um, where they're all special situations and I have stocks and cash uh, because I, I definitely believe stocks are better than bonds unequivocally, but you know, the market's very complex. It's not, not one market. You know, uh, I've been on the theme for a while now that we're really looking at three stock markets. When you look at the stock market, the first stock market, which everybody is enamored with, and I understand all the reasons why is why we'll, we'll call that the FANG market. Those are all the companies that are benefiting from the virus because their demand has been pulled forward, whether it's Amazon, Adobe, Facebook, Microsoft, you know, people like that. Um, and those stocks to a degree are better than gold. Uh, um, they are selling, selling at very rich valuations, but if you look at interest rates, they're not expensive. The trouble with it, if you, you know, I went back and again, I, I have notes which I like to use, I went back, I looked at the Nifty 50 of 1972, okay? Well, there's a high failure rate. In 1972, Avon at 65 times earnings was a Nifty 50. Dow Chemical, 25 times earnings. Eastman Kodak, 48 times. General Electric, 26 times. IBM, 37 times. Uh, Kmart, 34 times. Polaroid, 90 times. Revlon, 30 times. Sears Roebuck, 31 times. Kresge, Xerox. Xerox was 40 times earnings. So if you take a whole portfolio of the nifty 50 of today and say there's a 20% failure rate, the losses in that thing do a lot to sterilize the, you know, successful ones. So, you know, but I I understand that game and I have my largest position is Google. I have a big position in Microsoft. I have a decent sized position in Amazon, small position in Facebook. I, I, we were in Apple, we got out far too early and I'm not good at looking back. So I look forward. Uh, but that sector I understand, and relative to interest rates, not expensive. But uh, I tend to, s- to stick more in the value area. The second market is ludicrous, and that's the Robinhood market. That's these 30-year-old kids that 
or trading in and out of things. And uh, I don't want to insult them, but I, I have a sense they don't know what they're doing. Uh, a lot of them don't know what they're doing. About two months ago on TV, I regrettably said that I thought that market would end in tears. And the very next day, a young man committed suicide because he lost $700,000 day trading. But you look, you know, Carl Icahn is no fool. He's a brilliant guy. He's done a fabulous job in running his own financial affairs. You know, he sold his mistake in uh, Hertz at 72 cents a share. And three weeks later, the Robin Hood guys take it to five bucks. And it's bankrupt. Right. American Airlines enterprise value today is higher than it was pre-COVID virus, you know, uh, because of all the debt and equity they've issued. And that's because the Robin Hood crowd. And then you look what happened with Eastman Kodak, two to 60 to eight. I mean, it's crazy. And when you check into why some of these things are moving, it's the Robin Hood crowd involved. So I think I don't pay any attention to that market. It's an end in tears, et cetera. I stay away from it. The third market is the rest of the market. And there's plenty of value there. Uh, um, and you just got to, you know, manage your risk uh, accordingly. You know, uh, let me ask you, uh, let me drill down on that. Be, uh, two questions. One, well, actually, let me ask the first question first in, in and of itself as I, in ISO. Uh, Tesla, where, where is Tesla in that, that split between those three markets? That's in um, uh, market number one. Uh, and maybe it's got a foot in the market number two. You know, I learned over many years that stock splits mean nothing. You know, if, if I gave you five singles for a $5 bill, I didn't create any wealth. And when I look what Apple and Tesla did after their stock splits, because everybody got enamored, I, I just scratched my head and said, these people don't know what they're doing. Now, I, I, I'm not involved in Tesla because I, I'm like a, a corporate type of guy. And Elon's behavior, the guy is obviously a genius, but his behavior is such that uh, I'm not comfortable. You know, he's tweeting and this and that. And uh, the market cap of the company is just way beyond anything. I assume that, you know, Volkswagen just came out with a electric car, Porsche has got one at the upper end. Uh, you know, uh, everybody's gonna have an electric car and uh, we'll see what happens. But I, I tend not to buy the, here, the hereafter. You know, my, my average multiple in my portfolio is probably 10, 11 times earnings. Wow, yeah, that, that is, that, that's good value. Um, and let me let me think about, uh, here's how I'm thinking about that, that bifurcation. Let's forget about the Robin Hood stuff. Uh, when you look at the FANG and then you look at the rest of the market, basically what people are telling you is that the FANGs, they want to go to FANG, not just because the Fed is jack uh, keeping rates uh, down low and keeping their, their, their hand on the scale, but also because where's the growth going to come from over the, ne the next cycle? If you want growth. Oh, no question about it. Uh, these are, they're not, as I said, these stocks are viewed as better than gold, you know, uh, uh, the growth rates seem to be reasonably assured. Uh, demand is being pulled forward. They're a beneficiary of the virus. In my opinion, the major risk is the government. The government seems to be unable to deal with successful companies. So they want to break them up. <laughs> you know, the, all, all the companies that are providing incremental growth and employment, the government wants to attack. That makes a lot of sense. But um, no, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm happy. You know, I, uh, I have uh, a bunch of uh, them. Like I mentioned, I got Microsoft, I got Amazon, I got Facebook, I got Google. Uh, they're not expensive, and they're a beneficiary of the environment. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody pro uh, proposed an excess profits tax on the beneficiaries of the virus. Right. Yeah, I, I could see that as a one-time. They're saying that these, these are one-time gains. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, a port. Uh, what was it? Port Authority under Moses. It, weren't the the bridges supposed to stop uh, getting tolls after a certain period of time? But then it kept on going in perpetuity. Yeah, I would say that. Uh, you know, I I have a pet view here. A pet view. I believe in the progressive income tax structure. I believe rich people should pay more in taxes. What we have to do as a nation is coalesce around the question. What should the maximum tax rate be on wealthy people? Okay, because that will define the revenue yield to the government and the government has to size their activities to that revenue yield. Now, I have enormous respect for Warren Buffett, okay? I called him up seven years ago when he was talking about rich people paying more. I said, Warren, what do you got in mind? And his comment was, well, if you make a million dollars a year, 35%, if you make over $5 million a year, 40%. Well, I would submit if you live in California, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, you know, um, your tax rate is well into the 50s already. 
Uh, I have said publicly, I'm willing to work six months a year for the government, six months to myself. That feels fair to me. Okay. And it's not because I'm greedy. The 50% that I'm keeping, I pay a certain amount to live on. And the majority I give away to others less fortunate. My signature program, frankly, is I send 500 kids largely of color in Newark to college. I pay their tuition. I put $25 million in a fund called Koopman College Scholars. So I think these are, are, are terrific kids deserve a break. And so, you know, I'm big on providing equal opportunity, not equal outcomes. You know, I want to teach people how to fish. I don't want to give them fish. You know, uh, I, I, I did want to keep on the stocks, but since we're on this, what, so what do you think in terms of uh, capital gains, short term, long term capital gains? Because I think that the debate basically is that, uh, you know, if you're rich, you can you can actually derive your income from multiple sources. You're not getting an income from work right now. You're getting it from your investments. But how did you get investments by working hard and saving money? Right. So do we want to penalize thrift? Do we want to penalize people that have a rational lifestyle? Look, uh, uh, we're in a very I think troubled- that's where Buffett is going. So w- what's your view on that? The concept that we need to equalize those tax rates? Well, you know, probably most of the capital gains, uh, the result from inflation. So you're really just taxing inflation. I don't know. You got to ask an economist that question. <laughs> I would argue for- uh, greater efficiency in government. Uh, the government is tax and spend, and it becomes counterproductive. The guy that understood what was going on was Mike Bloomberg. You know, two or three years ago, they proposed in New York, this may be longer, I, I tend to lose sight of time, they proposed a billionaire's tax, and he correctly rejected it. He said, look, you lose one billionaire, there's gonna be more revenues than you get from everybody else. You know, Cuomo says people are leaving New York because of the weather. That's complete bullshit. People are leaving New York and Connecticut and New Jersey because the taxation is driving them away. California is now going to a 16% state income tax. You know, Biden wants to raise the federal bracket back to, I get 39.7 or whatever it is. So you take 39.7, take 16 in the state, uh, you know, it, it, it becomes a, a burden. But I, I'm sympathetic. I think rich people should pay more. But like I said before, what is the right number? If I, I, I somehow I, it rings true to me. If I work six months for the government, six months for myself, not unreasonable. I think there's a lot of things that could be done. The um, the uh, private equity, uh, this uh, you know carried interest, uh, carried interest. Seven, eight, eight, nine years ago on TV, I said they should eliminate it. I said if they if they're serious about tackling the budget deficit, they should do two things: eliminate carried interest and eliminate the Department of Education. We don't need a federal department at, uh, at the cabinet level that has a $100 billion budget to tell states how to educate the children, okay? This is not segregation, that's long past, okay? The states know what they gotta do to educate their children. We have to become more efficient. This whole, the ability of the real estate people to roll over real estate sales tax-free by rolling into other real estate, that should be eliminated. You know, uh, there are a lot of things they could be doing. I'm definitely against the wealth tax, that makes no sense. Those countries that have adopted it have largely dropped it. It's going to lead to a lot of illicit activity. The price of gold will soar if they go to a wealth tax because people will start buying gold and hide it. You, you don't want that, you know? And uh, that's my view. And, I, and that comes from a person who's willing to give away his money. You know, it's not a selfish thing. It's just a common sense thing. You know, uh, we, we definitely want to get into that I, at the end because I want to talk about, you know, the future but I also want to talk about the here and now as compared to the past. I'm looking for signals because we were just talking about, uh, you know, the fangs versus the rest of the market. And you mentioned something about the nifty 50. I was thinking about the nifty 50. I was thinking about the internet bubble, you know, Xerox trading at 70 times. You know, if I have Apple today trading at 40 times, 45 times earnings, how does that compare in terms of the concept of a parabolic blow off top to the nifty 50 in the early 70s. There's a big or, difference. In the nifty uh, 50 in the early 70s, the 10-year U.S. government bond was 6.5% for the year. Right. The 10-year U.S. government bond, which is a key component of the discount rate, is 65 basis points. So you can come up with any number you want to come up with. Uh, my argument is if interest rates belong where they are, that's a negative signal for the economy, and it has an implication of what you should expect to earn in the equity market. But... Uh, I can't argue that the nifty 50 today is overvalued. What I can argue is if you took 
today is nifty 50. Mm-hmm. And in all honesty, I can't even name half of them. I, I know the big leading ones, but the other ones. Salesforce as an example. Salesforce, right. Uh, uh, Oracle. Off. If, you, if you took the 50 today and you said you had a failure rate similar to what you had in 1972, the expected return from that portfolio is going to be relatively unattractive. So I mentioned these, these were nifty 50s I mentioned before. Avon, I don't know, is it $3 stock now? Uh, um, uh, Eastman Kodak went bankrupt. It was a 48 multiple stock in 1972. Uh, IBM seeded the market to others. That was 37 times earnings in 1972. Kmart went bankrupt, 34 times earnings. Sears Roebuck went bankrupt, 31 times earnings. Xerox lost the market to the Japanese, was 41 times earnings. So if you have a similar situation where 20% of today's nifty 50s don't turn out to be so nifty, uh, uh, your overall portfolio return is not going to be that attractive. You know, um, go, you, you were about to say something. Yeah, well, I say, and then now in the market number three, where I tend to traffic, I, I use an example, a company called uh, Mr. Cooper, symbol is C-O-O-P. I take no credit for discovering it. Uh, my good friend, Sam Martini, did an excellent amount of work. Everything he did was doable and knowable by other people in the street, but they're lazy. This company a month ago reported earnings of $500 million in cash in the quarter, which was equal to 50% of their market capitalization in one quarter, okay? They're gonna earn this year maybe $7 because of all this refinancing activity. They're gonna end this year with cash about 10 or $12 a share and a $24 book value. It's not in the nifty 50 category, so it's overlooked. Rocket Mortgage, which has captured everybody's imagination, sells a six times book value. Mr. Cooper is trading at 20, and the book value is going to end this year at $24, half of which is in cash. So that's where I tend to look, and I could take that luxury as a family office. Because, you know, in, in the real world, if every stock you own is in, on the new high list, you're a momentum player. Okay, there's risk associated with that. If every stock you own is new, on the new low list, you're out of business. Okay, and these hedge funds, which have quarterly liquidity, at times can't take the long view because they're worried about underperforming and people coming in and redeeming their money. Uh, I'm a family office. I can just fire myself. You know, there there are two ways I want to go with this. Remind me uh, at the end to go back to uh, your stock selection, because I think that's interesting. I know that you had something with uh, energy transfer equity as well. I want to talk to some of your picks. But when you mentioned, uh, you know, the momentum immediately it made me think of market structure. Uh, I spoke to a gentleman who you talk about the American dream. To me, he's a perfect example of the American dream. I had a, a conversation with him, an interview with him, like with you back in February. Uh, Thomas Petterfee. I know Tom. I know Tom. Market structure has been destroyed. I wrote a letter two and a half years ago to Jay Clayton of the SEC asking him to reinstate the uptick rule, explaining to him when I came to Wall Street 50 years ago, okay, uh, commissions were 25, 30, 40, 50 cents a share, and the Volcker rule didn't exist. So the brokerage firms had the economic incentive to stabilize markets because they had some vigorish, they had a spread between what they paid and uh, uh, what the market price was because of the commission structure, that's gone. So they can't stabilize legally and otherwise. Secondly, 80% of the volume 50 years ago was done on the New York Stock Exchange. Today, 80% of the volume is off board. So the specialists are not relevant as stabilizers. And thirdly, you know, in 1938, they instituted the uptick rule, which required you to have an uptick to short a stock. It worked effectively, I think, for 70 odd years. And in 2007, for some unexplained reason, the SEC eliminated the uptick rule which gave rise to all these quantitative traders who know nothing about value, they know everything about price. So they buy strength, they sell weakness, it exaggerates the moves in the market. So market structure is is destroyed. This is why in the fourth quarter of 2018, with no economic justification, you had the worst quarter uh, uh, since the Great Depression in the stock market. And then when people woke up and saw it wasn't an economic event, the stock market surged. So all these quantitative systems extend the market on the upside when it's going up and extend the market on the downside when it's going down. These uh, programs, these algorithms, they're programmed. Eight months ago, you heard the word China uh, and they sell a buy depending upon the news on China. Now nobody cares about China. Now everybody's focused on the virus. 
and the the solution. In my opinion, the market will probably peak within 24 hours of solution to the virus. And I'm optimistic that we will find a vaccine. We will cure the virus. You know, um, uh, uh, Thomas Petterfee, what he was saying that the the whole problem with this whole um, market structure thing, you're talking about the uptick rule in particular, is the flash crash. And, you know, the way that I understood what he was saying is, look, you could have a crash uh, that's 25, 30 percent. And it's so traumatic that uh, the market doesn't recover back to where it was before. And with the Fed having expended all of its firepower, it's down. I, I, I don't think the Fed has done that. You know, it's interesting. Six months ago, that was a prevalent view. The Fed was out of ammunition. They came, <laughs> they'll come up with every acronym possible, you know, including free money, helicopter money, whatever. I, I wouldn't. We got things we could do. The economy is getting better. I mean, the virus is important. The economy is getting better. Is, is that a positive uh, to, for the Fed to intervene? Because, you know, when I read uh, what you say about some of the your concerns uh, going forward, when you look at, you know, your fears for the market going forward, one of them is interventionism. Well, well, it's not a fear. I think the government is doing what they have to do. But I think it's a, the, the practical fact, in my opinion, is the extent that the government is called upon to moderate the downside, they have every right to moderate the upside. And if the, if the market is dependent upon government uh, uh, life support, it should have an effect on price earnings ratios. It's as simple as that. that and I think the, the government introduced QE in 2008. We never got out of QE. And now we have this artificially low interest rates with their penalizing savers. Well, when you say they're penalizing savers, uh, early in the conversation, I was thinking when you were talking about that, my mom, who's 90 now, you know, she was getting, uh, she was investing in, uh, you know, CDs. Uh, she had a huge amount in CDs, 6%. She probably right. got free television when she opened up the account <laughs> at the bank too. Right, you know. And then suddenly the, the, the uh, 2008 crisis comes, the Fed lowers interest rates to zero. This is when you were talking about, you know, people moving from one market to the next, right? You, and, and so she was forced out of the CD market because there's nothing there. She's forced to take on more risk at her age, uh, even though she doesn't want to. They're forcing everybody to move out of the risk curve. Uh, the, the person that bought T-bills says, I can't survive on 10 basis points. I'll take a duration risk and I'll buy T-bonds. The T-bond buyer says 67 basis points doesn't work for me. I'm going to buy industrial credits. The industrial credit person says I can't survive on 3%. I'm going to buy high yield. High yield is 6%. The, six, the high yield guy says I can't survive on 6%. I'm going to buy structured credits, CLOs, which are much higher. And the CLO person says, well, I'm going to put 25% of my fund in equities because equities make more sense than bonds. And this is what's happening. And so everybody's moving on the risk curve. And one day, there'll be a fundamental development that people will want to come in on the risk curve. I think there's another problem with the interest rate policy. And that is, you know, your grandmother worked, I'm sure, very hard for her whole career to accumulate what she has. And when uh, she wants to retire, I'm sure she's retired. You said she's 90 years old. It was my mom. She's the one who's, who's 90. But basically... Uh, when people like your mom go to the financial planner and say, look, I worked my whole life. I got a million, two million dollars. What can I earn in this money when I retire? And they tell her virtually nothing. She can't retire, which uh, basically makes it more difficult for young people to enter the labor force. In addition, you, you turn upside down all these state and local government pension plans, corporate pension plans. They can't earn the indicated returns to provide the retirement benefits that they're obligated to provide. So I think it's very complicated. Um, and uh, I think it's also pushed, it's, it's pulled forward demand. I look, I have an exhibit here. Whenever you bought into the S&P when it was above 22 times earnings, the one year return, the three year return, the five year return have been very uninspiring. And I think what's gonna happen in the next five years is interest, profits will rise by a modest amount, uh, interest rates will rise and the market will go nowhere. That's, right. my, that's my central view. Central view. Now, I'm not making long-term forecasts. Like we we got to first get through this election and make sure we avoid a constitutional crisis. <laughs> well, oh yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, what do you do as an investor when in that sort of an environment? I mean, where where are you investing? How have you changed your investments when you're getting zero on your T bills and you have that sort of outlook for equities, public equities? Well, I try to find the things that are mispriced in the market. 
uh, again, I'm a professional, I'm in a better position, I'm in a different position than the public, but I would say to me, it'd be a, f a portfolio of good quality stocks and cash. I would have a minimal participation in the bonds. And if you were sophisticated enough to understand high yield credits, I think there's opportunities in the high yield market. I bought a couple of seven and a half percent bonds yesterday at 80, 85 cents in a dollar, you know, eight, nine percent yield to maturity. I'm happy with that. The only negative for me is I'm a full taxpayer and, you know, you're paying away half the income in the form of taxes. So I'd rather be in the capital gains in a common stock. But right. It's the selection. I've been very fortunate. I have a lot of everything. I have cash, I have bonds, I have stocks. My bonds are all high yield bonds. I don't own any. U.S. government bonds. Other than my cash, I own T-bills. It's, it's difficult. I, I was going to ask you earlier, because you talked about Mr. Cooper, uh, a mortgage servicing company that's printing money. What If you could give uh, some other uh, places where you think uh, people could put their money well, and we, why. Uh, these are, uh, go with the assumption I own them. Okay. Uh, uh, but these you are know, I've seen some of this before. Uh, you, you talked about energy transfer equity. Yeah, well, uh, energy transfer is a bit of a turnaround. You know, the stock yields 19%. And I can tell you for a fact that when stocks don't yield 19% forever, either the dividend gets cut or the stocks go up. In this case, I anticipate the dividend will ultimately be cut, but the stock will go up. I think the assets are worth twice what the stock is trading for. And uh, uh, so that's one we own. Uh, another one I own, which is very controversial, I've been wrong, Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, uh, I'm losing money, is uh, AMC Networks, 17% uh, controlled by the Dolan family. They just launched a Dutch self-tender uh, to buy back 10 million shares, $250 million worth of stock, which is roughly 10 million shares, which is about 20% of the company. And I pay attention when a large owner is buying back stock. Um, and, and so that's one that I own. Athene in the annuity business, Ashland. Um, which we think is a takeover candidate, Ferro, similarly. We have a very big position in Fiserv, uh, the credit card company, uh, doing extremely well, very cheap for what it represents. You mentioned uh, Mr. Cooper. One that I don't quite understand, um, uh, Navient yields like 7% and sells at three times earnings, and they provide student loans, but bulk of which are guaranteed by the U.S. government. So they, don't, they don't have huge credit risk other than the credit risk of the U.S. government. But there's plenty of things to do. I just uh, try to keep my, I, I don't want to be fully invested. <coughs> I would say this, if I had to make a choice, being all in or all out, I would be all in in the third market I talked about. The value right. market. And you, you didn't mention gold or silver or other alternative investments. I bought gold for the first time in my life a week ago. Very oh, small yeah. amount. Very yeah, I you know um, I understand the case for gold. You know, uh, we're we're just uh, you know we're on the way to some kind of banana republic situation. You know, we uh, nobody's worrying about the debt that's being created, uh, and I I'm focused on who pays for the party when the party is over. You know, uh, as I mentioned before, it took 244 years to go from zero national debt to 21 trillion. That's going up at four trillion dollars, maybe five trillion dollars this year. And what about next year? <coughs> and we're getting away with it because interest rates are near zero. Government is financing themselves very low, but that's not a permanent situation. If interest rates are going to be zero permanently, basically it says a lot about future economic growth and future returns in the equity market. Right. Yeah. Like Japan, as an example. Yeah, Japan or even Europe now. When you said Banana Republic, uh, honestly, the first thing that comes to mind is, is the thing that you said before about a constitutional crisis. Um, you know, I know that you in the past, uh, you thought, uh, you know, of Donald Trump as being sort of a Reagan-esque type of figure, but it sounds... Oh, no, no, I, I didn't. I, 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 let me just correct that. Uh, if I've said this on TV a year and a half ago, and I'll repeat it again. I did not vote for Trump. And I did not vote for Clinton. Okay. Right. I wrote in Mitt Romney. Okay. Trump is worse than I feared. However, what I fear more is socialism. Because I take to quoting Winston Churchill, who said, the main vice of capitalism is the uneven distribution of prosperity. The main vice of socialism is the equal distribution of misery. Now, Trump has done a good job of painting Biden as a socialist. I'm looking forward to the debates. I want to see what Biden has to say about law and order and 
capitalism, socialism, etc. The fear is that Bernie Sanders, who is a who, who's a communist, he's not a socialist, he's a communist. There's a difference, okay? AOC, communist, basically. And I don't say that in a nasty way, that's they, they, their political views, okay? I think what's made America great is our commitment to capitalism, okay? And I, I, I take the quoting Winston Churchill again. He said, the main vice, he says, you don't make poor people rich by making rich people poor. What's, what, what is this envy of rich people? Because Elizabeth Warren is so vindictive towards wealthy people. How do you get to be wealthy in America? You develop a product or a service somebody needs and they repay you for it. Is the world better off or worse off because of Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos? And, and so, you know, as you say that, uh, I, I, I'm thinking to myself. I'm saying, how do you get, how, uh, let me finish the thought. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. How do you get to be rich? Bill Gates developed something the world needed. The world's much better off with Bill Gates and he's taking all this wealth and he's giving it back to society. What is this, like penis envy? What What is this? Envy of wealthy people. You know, most wealthy people I know, Ken Langone, Bertie Marcus, give more back to society than they spend in themselves. You know, uh, I, I know the Home Depot story pretty well, but I'm friendly with Bernie Marcus. The man was fired at Sandy Siegeloff. He was at a job. Okay, he had three kids. He had a big mortgage in his house. He calls up Ken Langone in tears, you know, the bemoaning his situation. And Langone says, what the hell are you crying about? I'll raise you the money. You'll open up your superstore. He gets, I think, um, 50 families, I forget the number, 40 families, 50 families to put up $2 million each. Uh, and they uh, opened up his first store. Today, Home Depot's got probably a market cap of $250 billion, I'm guessing. And they employ, they have 3,000 millionaires in the company. They got millionaires as a result of their stock. Bernie and Ken are giving away untold millions to society. That's the American dream. That's right. the American dream. And these left wingers are pissing all over that dream. It's wrong. It's wrong. I look at myself. Like I said before, I don't brag about myself. I consider myself the luckiest guy alive. I basically, you know, first generation born in America, all public school education. I get into Wall Street. I hit it big and I'm giving it away. That's what it's all about. And, you know, going back to what you were saying about capitalism, I, I know that you, you, and you're making the distinction between capitalism, socialism and communism. You're talking about the means of production versus the redistribution of wealth. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so that's that's why you consider uh, that you want to see where Biden is. But right now you think you have two bad choices, you told me earlier. Yeah, well, I, I bemoan, you know, I can only get in trouble. I piss everybody off. But basically... In a nation of 330 million people, we left to these two choices. I mean, uh, Trump is, uh, uh, you know, it's sad. It's sad because his economic ideas have not been unreasonable. His deportment is disgraceful, the way he treats people. You know, Mitt Romney is not a jackass. You know, these are all things he said. Uh, uh, Rex Tillerson is not dumb as a rock. You know, John McCain was, in fact, a true war hero. You know, John Dingle, hopefully for him, even though he had different political views than me, is looking down, not looking up. He treats people with great disrespect that have different views of him. And that's not presidential. OK, uh, I signed off on him during the campaign in 2016 when he mocked a New York Times reporter that had cerebral palsy. You learn when you're five years old, you don't make fun of handicapped people. He didn't learn that lesson. OK, I look at the turnover of his staff. Unbelievable. It says something. Then you look at Biden, you know, uh, Biden has got to speak up for himself. Uh, I, I got to, you know, I'm disappointed in both political parties. In other words, I'm surprised that more Republicans have not spoken out against Trump's antics. And I'm disappointed that more Democrats have not spoken out about the violence that's occurring in a lot of these Democratic states. You know, so they're both to be criticized. You know, I'm looking for a good centrist. You know, I love my country. So if you had to vote today, how would you I, I can't give you an answer because I'm waiting for the debates. Right. I want to give. I want Biden to give me a reason to vote for him. I want him to strongly, strongly come out and condemn the violence. I want him to strongly acknowledge that he's a centrist. That AOC and Bernie Sanders are not going to have. They may have his ear, but they're not going to have his his compliance. I believe in the end of the day, capitalism is what made America great.
And so where do we go from here, uh, both in terms of our economy, that is the U.S., and also in terms of investments? I mean, if you had to put your predictive hat on, what, what, is, what does it look like two, three years down the line? I expect the market to provide very little in the way of returns over the next few years. I think that the economy will slowly recover. Interest rates will slowly rise and price earnings ratios will uh, decline. And uh, I went back, whenever you bought into the S&P, when the multiple was above 22 times, the returns on a five-year basis were slightly above zero. So you'll get your dividend return. And, and there's precedent for this. You know, I joined Goldman Sachs on February 1st of 1967. The Dow was 1,000. In 1982, the Dow was 1,000. And I made my money picking stocks, and that's what I'm going to have to do. You know, I, I don't think there would be a big tailwind to the stock market. And uh, there's a lot of things going on in the world that we have to worry about. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Maybe we can do it again sometime soon. Sounds good. Thank you very much. You stay well. Thank you. You too. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. For even more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a month's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.